uh, i do appreciate uh, your uh, saying that uh, uh, we in a way piggy backed on uh, on asean to use your words uh, and asean piggy backed on you uh, in fact japan uh, is the first power which began to bring in capital and investment into asean uh, starting for example with automobile industry in indonesia back in the 70s if not earlier and the change began to happen so in a way it was mutual what really has changed now is the consensus among the two big powers or if i may say four big powers uh, us china india and japan on the region has broken down it was there till 2007 or 8 and definitely till about 2012 now everybody is talking fundamentally of the uh, very sharpening competition between china and america on the one hand the world is worried about uh, a, a g2 a condominium of us and china on the other hand you are worried about the cold war uh, maybe turning hot war which is obviously inconceivable as a result asean simply uh, has no other way except to start hedging which all of us do are doing now maybe not the us but japan is doing it india is doing it asean every single member of asean state is doing it that is in its own interest to do it so i would simply put it that um, we are in a new era and uh, as uh, uh, professor uh, chatterji said earlier uh, you just cannot uh, give a final shot when the film is still unfolding um okay i i just wanted to very quickly respond i mean i think your interjection about the um logic of consequences interests and the logic of appropriateness values is is really important to reflect on and i think it's useful to have that definition but i think we also need to reflect on the fact that some consequences are not deemed appropriate so it's now not appropriate to use chemical weapons even though the outcome could be beneficial and serve interests um so I think they still have a much more uh, interactive relationship with each other than than perhaps um we we are This is the end in means test. Um so. in a way, yes. Yes, exactly. Um but we can continue this conversation later. Um Zeynep, can I can I attend to you for your question? I've got a very simple and quick question to the panel. What are the efforts made by governments of ASEAN to strengthen relations with India? and this pta this pre preferential trading arrangements with india and secondly i'm not sure whether this has been sort of sort of answered but how will asean countries balance us security interests and us values no i think uh, on asean uh, india relationship at the macro level uh, i would like to inform you with uh, much satisfaction that uh, the relationship has progressed uh, very well in the past 25 years it was virtually non existent at the level of the regional uh, nature but uh, uh, since uh, the adoption of uh, our uh, Uh, look east policy back in 1991 92 uh, things began to happen gradually uh, and they moved to a situation where the second edition or second version of policy was brought in 5 years back through act east policy so asean and india are very good partners uh, both because they share values but more importantly because they share interests uh, ASEAN needs powers to balance the situation in the region uh and uh, ASEAN also needs India's large market similarly India has had to expand its uh, world view its uh, broad region where it would play a more active role than it did before 
and so you have a situation where now uh, asean is the only country uh, sorry the region where uh, our top 3 leaders president prime minister vice president all of them have visited i think almost every single country of asean in the last 3 uh, to 4 years so this shows the high policy priority that is being given to asean uh, with regard to the trade side i am not an expert on trade but this is a critical year this is a crucial year when the negotiations for uh, rcep regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement are moving forward uh, we will have to wait until after the elections are over in india and we will have to see to what extent china uh, and uh, asean would be able to show sufficient sensitivity to india's needs also because frankly without india rcep train is not going to go anywhere this is the assessment in india and so if that sensitivity comes it is uh, very likely that the indian leadership and more importantly indian industry would feel sufficiently confident to go and join the highly competitive game of trade in uh, in east asia um by the way there's one uh, sort of intellectual uh, influence on asean of japan as a matter of fact i mean this is the uh, the flying geese paradigm i mean this is borrowed from japan in the 19 and uh, 1930s the whole idea being that you uh, go forward in a in a f uh, flying geese uh, formation with the birds behind drawing strength from the flapping of the wings of or the birds ahead so uh, this is something that asean does quite well uh, quite well where it falls down somewhat is really foreign policy because the perceived national self interests are different are increasingly going to be different because in a world where you will have a withdrawal of of the major uh, players uh, you'll be left to to yourselves and you're having to address without your your uh, uh, major backer in the behind the scenes so my suspicion is that foreign policy will increasingly become a challenging area to agree on uh where you know sark did a bit better but, but but avoided so much of everything that it didn't quite work thank you so we're moving into the final furlong so i'll i'll cluster some questions if that's okay um uh david fortuna anwar uh, uh james mail and uh the lady at, at the back there firstly in observ observations on your questions about values and interests is all very interesting when we are talking about scholars but policy makers don't care whether do you're doing doing idealists or realists and constructivists they have to have all the tools that they can use mm. and and you know uh what whatever works so that it it doesn't make sense i mean i've been in government uh, <laughs> for quite a long time yes. most of the times values are important and new values evolve and how you define your national interests evolve Uh, I mean, we can look at uh, Indonesia. How we define our national interests evolve over time. Even even though the doctrine of foreign policy more or less is the same, but how Sukarno did it, how Suharto did it, how Esbey did it, what made the changes? It's the changes in how they look at themselves and how they look at how the state should be run, and and that affects their foreign policies. So it doesn't really make sense. You know, those are this objective, un, uh, untouched national interests about security, economics, and so on. and values in the other hands because you know as as a, as a social constructs uh, they feed on each other but there's no single uh, source of it the different different uh, aspects of it so but this is an interesting you know uh, it's a debate that we need to, to continue on asian congratulations gentlemen uh, i mean i i really enjoyed uh, the discussions on asian uh, but firstly i think it's very very important uh, to to remember that uh asean had a very minimalist objective from the very beginning so the the constant uh, reference to eu um, amongst a lot of scholars was totally irrelevant to asean because eu was for integration asean was created to strengthen the national resilience of each country so you know to actually to strengthen nation states so that was the basic principle so that you needed regional harmony uh, so that you can concentrate on your internal affairs rather than having an asean project that was in the beginning but the goal posts have changed so things have also evolved within asean so when we're talking about uh, values in asean's foreign policy i think we also needs to look you know the progression of how asean 
sees itself as well. Uh, the idea of an ASEAN Charter would have been totally inconceivable when it was founded or even 20 years ago. And values were not issues that people wanted to talk about. There's mostly uh, principles. And uh, you didn't mention the TAC as that the key principle of ASEAN, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, which is the Pacific Settlement of Dispute. Uh, you know, that is very key to, to, to ASEAN. And I think we need to differentiate between intra-ASEAN foreign relations and how later on ASEAN has evolved into uh, uh, the centrality and the desire to engage with the, with the wider, the, uh, the wider uh, world. Uh, that, you know, there are, so there are different elements that have moved. And the ASEAN Charter is the first attempt to codify a lot of the principles and values. And I think that's only the first time that we talk about ASEAN. Uh, you know, should we have a shared value? Because before that, the only shared is way is just Mushawarah Mufakat, which is from the Indonesian one, consultation and consensus. Uh, uh, and, and there was no desire, you know, to have a, a common values. But once ASEAN decided on a community, then they said, you know, you cannot really have a community only based on interest. It has also have to be based on common values. But that is still very debated. Thank and finally, why has ASEAN been quite successful? My, my thesis was actually on ASEAN, and they did a comparison of that. So we do owe a lot to Suharto. It's not Indonesian values, but Javanese value. He quoted about Tut Wuri Handayani, leading from behind. If you are the biggest, do not, you don't need to bang on the table to show that you are big, because that's very uncouth. So it has, you have you know, to be much more refined about it. Thank you. Um, can we collect the questions because we're running out of time? Sorry, Ambassador. Uh, James Mayle next. Uh, then our guest from JNU, is that right? Uh, Delhi University. No. Delhi. Delhi University. And then Chris has a question, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And, then, and that will be our final question. Um, to begin with, uh, I thought this panel was the first one which had given us a chance of moving forward on the total agenda of... Um, how we could begin to think about a new universalism which would bind everyone more cooperatively. Uh, it seems to be falling apart in the South China Sea, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But to take up your point, Kate, uh, I mean, Alexander Wendt may be able to say uh, anarchy is what states make of it. So there's nothing to stop them in theory from agreeing globally on a kind of three C's formula uh, as a new way forward, having found that um, humanitarian and other forms of intervention have a, a tendency to abort and so on. But I'm worried here, and I'm worried on two counts. I mean, one is that I've never been able to understand what Alexander Wendt adds to Karl Marx. And Karl Marx, after all, said mankind makes his own history but not in any way he chooses. And it's the not in any way he chooses, which is the crucial clause, because we're all constrained. And that's why I think what I heard about the South China Sea, and I really would like to hear some, just a bit more discussion if we've got time on the South China Sea, because it's not in itself. Yeah, I mean, in the case of my country, which has been riding piggyback on behind the American Navy, just as they did behind ours in, in the 19th century. But I mean, uh, the freedom of the seas has been a crucial point of continuity in British foreign pol policy since the repeal of the Corn Laws. And a challenge, to, and, and of course it's buttressed by the very uh, carefully worked out and tortuously negotiated Law of the Sea Convention. Now, it, it, the South China Sea may, con series of conflicts may be marginal globally, but they're certainly not marginal to the countries concerned, but they also affect this broad principle, because are you going to be able to sign up to a convention and then say, but nothing that happened during the century of humiliation applies, which is roughly the issue, because if you're going to try and make uh, states uh, uh, sign up to a, a much more peaceful approach to 
conflict resolution than they have done since the end of the Cold War, you're going to have to uh, strengthen the, what unites states rather than what divides them. Uh, I'm Dr. Bharti Chibri from University of Delhi. Uh, well, a quick, very quick observation to Chair's remarks on the comparison between European Union and SARC or ASEAN for that matter. Basically, in the context of European Union, uh, all the countries, they decided, the member, they decided to pull in their sovereignty and in terms of going as far as complete, complete integration to a common currency. Uh, in the context of SARC and ASEAN, since we have achieved our freedom after long colonial rule, most of us, so for us, our sovereignty was very dear. So a question of a supranational organization does not arise. So it was more in the context of functionalism and neo-functionalism from Mitrani to Ernest Haas and Joseph Nye. Uh, and a question to the panelists. Well, uh, ambassadors, a great presentation, both of you. Uh, well, you mentioned about, you briefly touched upon ASEAN way. Uh, do you think that ASEAN foreign uh, policy values have changed over the years? There's a shift uh, from non-intervention to constructive engagement. And if you believe that there's a shift, then how successful is it in terms of foreign policy? And also, um, in terms of ASEAN being a very successful regional organization as far as developing countries are concerned, completely agreed. But emulating it in SARC or South Asia is, is very difficult because ground realities, geopolitics is very, very different in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Thank you. And final question from Krishnan Srinivas. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of how uh, and why ASEAN has survived as a success story, uh, I think uh, we have to look for a, a fourth C. You mentioned three Cs. I think you might add a fourth one, which is caution. Now, um, you're the expert, so you can help me. Um, I think there wasn't a summit of ASEAN for about seven years af after it started, maybe it's longer, I don't know, at least seven years. And um, since that time, of course, the pace has picked up. But ASEAN has shown remarkable caution, firstly, in the question of intrusion into other countries' sovereignty. Secondly, even in terms of uh, economic integration. And I think that um, um, the contrast with the European Union is significant because I think the European Union went pell-mell into integration, and uh, now I think they're reaping the consequences. Uh, ASEAN survivability, to me, is much greater. Okay, um, ambassadors, you have about two to three minutes each. Okay, uh, all, all right, uh, j just a bit of a, uh, not value added, because uh, uh, nothing what I say would be of value, but I want to add something to what I've said. In terms of differences on, ground, on the ground between ASEAN and Southeast Asia, uh, uh, SARC and ASEAN states. You see, in, in ASEAN, the states, the states are much better defined than in South Asia. South Asia, one of the th problems we have to grapple is we do not know, uh, we are not certain as to where one state begins and the other ends. Uh, on the one hand, you see, we have, there is a tremendous intellectual and emotional uh, confusion in defining state boundaries because uh, one uh, uh, sort of blends into the other, you know, Punjab, Bengal, etc. These are same cultures divided. So it's far more amorphous. So uh, you do not know uh, whether you must stress the commonalities or you must stress, stress the distinctiveness. Sometimes if you stress the commonalities too much, it becomes a problem. And if you st stress the distinctiveness too much, as India and Pakistan does, that also becomes, becomes a problem. So that is one thing in SARC that we are having to grapple with. And there's a very crucial distinction between uh, SARC and, and ASEAN, and partly answers uh, the question as to why uh, uh, ASEAN is succeeding more than SARC. Thank you. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Devi. I think uh, you made uh, uh, additional comments which uh, expanded our understanding. 
uh, I think I would, uh, I would very much agree that ASEAN began with low expectations uh, and then slowly progressed. Uh, uh, the point that I want to stress here is that ASEAN was not always 10 countries from the beginning. They were just five. Then for a long time uh, later, Brunei, the sixth one came. Then much, much later, four joined one by one. So from five to six to 10, it was already a long story. And as new people came, new member states came, the institution did undergo certain kind of change because various national identities were coming and getting welded into the whole thing. Uh, particularly after Indochina joined, it was in a way a kind of a new incarnation of an old organization. So yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, it has been changing, the values have been changing, but more importantly, the international environment has changed. And once again, I would stress the change began in 2008. This has been a seminal change. This involved the change in geopolitics of the region. And therefore, what happens in the next five or two, 10 years uh, will depend not so much on ASEAN uh, as on the uh, balance of power in the region. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, I agree um, the idea that there should be fourth C caution is uh, very, very true. Uh, I think ASEAN, to me, they seem to be very uh, pragmatic people. They are not, in that sense, driven so much by ideology, although they have their own ideals and principles, uh, but they are willing to accommodate. This is the central theme, and this is what, uh, uh, you know, the Javanese concept. I had the honor to spend four years in Indonesia. The concept there is, First of all, don't speak too much. Secondly, don't speak loudly. And third, make sure you do not make the other guy lose his face. It all has been transplanted onto the ASEAN way. This is something that the rest of the regions of the world need to learn from each other. On a lighter note, although, the one point on which I am inclined to criticize ASEAN, particularly ASEAN diplomats, they cannot be accused of brevity. They produce reams and reams of declarations every six months, and we must be the only fools going through them to look for something new. Thank you. Just to say, Chris, between the, for the fourth C, uh, if you were to choose the word uh, circumspection rather than caution, would you choose that? Because that seems to be more apt. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. I think probably we had six or seven C's there. Consultation, oh, compromise, oh, oh, oh. consensus, oh, caution, constructivism, and the final C was the South China Sea. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers and our audience for uh, daring to dream and caring to share. Thank you very much. announcement uh, thank you so much we would like now take a break for about uh, half an hour or so and uh, meet for dinner at 6 30 outside at patio uh, towards your left thank you so much 6 30 we'll start uh, with 6 30 and move on to dinner <laughs>